And Father God, um, just as we come before you right now, Lord, we just, we again, we recognize what a privilege it is uh, to enter into your word. And Lord, just to be taught by your Holy Spirit, that you would just, that you would set aside this time to meet with us, uh, Lord, just to communicate everything that you want to communicate to each one of us. Your word is living and your word is active and you just have such a way of ministering to exactly what we're going through and exactly what we need as far as equipping and and strengthening and encouraging, Lord, and convicting. Um, you just, you know exactly where we are and you know exactly how to reach us. And we just surrender this time to you that you would be speaking into our lives and just shaping our hearts, uh, drawing us closer to you, Lord. And we, we give this time over into your hands for that purpose. So we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be starting in verse 18 here in chapter 1, but it has been a number of weeks now since we've been in this book. So we're going to, as we always do, go through a little bit of review in this. But again, Paul is writing this letter, the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to what is still a very young church in Corinth, just a handful of years old at this point since this church has been planted. And the church, it's it's an enormous city. The church is growing very quickly in this city. This gospel of grace and mercy is is catching fire in this city. But as this church is growing, it's also dividing very deeply as it grows, dividing into many different factions. And in that, it's riddled with quite a few issues that Paul is now addressing with them head on. And we've talked about how everything that we're going to consider, every single thing that we're going to consider within the context of this letter, it's going to echo in the simple truth that we saw in verse 9 of this chapter 1, which says God is faithful. God is faithful, and he has called you into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we will return to that truth frequently and repeatedly as we move through this book. There will be correction And there will be instruction, there will be conviction, certainly, but through all of it, we have to remember and have to return to that truth. God is faithful. He is the one who will address these things in our life. If we would just let him address these things in our life, God is faithful, and he has called you into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In that term, our Lord, as we move through, it's truly the key to this entire letter, who is your Lord in life. Who is your Lord? The theme verse as we move through comes out of Romans chapter 8, verse 6. And it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And we've talked about in that how to live with any form, any manner of dual lordship in our lives or multiple lordship in our lives, to live with anyone or anything other than Jesus as the Lord as the chief, as the ruler over our lives, over any part of our lives, that is the very essence of carnality. When we talk about carnality, that is what it is. And ultimately, when we do that, when we fall into that, it will be death to you in your spiritual walk. But to live continually pursuing and continually surrendering to Jesus as Lord, not just to Jesus as Savior, he is our Savior, but to surrender to him as our Lord, that is the essence of the spiritually minded life, that he would be Lord over all of who we are. And that is where you will find that life and that peace that we seek. So the challenge to us as we move through in this is to take inventory in everything we consider. Take inventory daily, hourly. Who is Lord right now? Who has this moment in my life right now? Who's calling the shots right now? Is Jesus leading the way for you? Are you deferring to where he leads? Are you deferring to God's will right now? Or is it me? Am I Lord right now in my own life? Or is it my spouse? Is my spouse the Lord in my own life? Is it my kids? Are they Lord right now? Is it my work? My pastimes, my hobbies, my own set of philosophies that I've gathered, are these things, Lord, who is Lord right now in your life? Because anything can creep in and take over if you let it. Anything. And very few people ever say, I'm going to give my life over to this thing right now. Nobody says, I'm going to give my life to whatever it is. You know, these things creep in over a period of time and take control without you really even fully realizing what's happened. And they take hold. And they assume the throne in our heart. They take over as Lord before we even really realize what is happening. But when we give our hearts into the hands of Jesus, 
constantly and continually when he has our hearts. It can all be set in perfect order in just a moment, but you have to give it to him. You have to let him have that lordship. And then last time we were together in this letter together, uh, it was three weeks ago now, <laughs> but Paul really started to get into the correction and the instruction portion of this letter. And we talked about for all of the myriad issues that were facing this church in Corinth, the first thing he brought to the surface was this idea of division. Because without unity in Christ, everything else will fall apart. So the first thing he brought forward was division. We talked about how, how when, we, when we have that carnally-minded life, when we talk about carnality itself, it's not simply self-infliction or self-destruction in your walk with the Lord. It doesn't just affect you when you live a carnally-minded life. It's something that has a widespread effect, widespread in a family and in a church body, in a fellowship, in a workplace. At its base, carnality in a life, it will always eventually lead to division in the body of Christ. Always. We're on the reverse side of things. Spiritual maturity will always lead to unity in the body of Christ. So the commendation and the encouragement to us as we move through is grow up. Be spiritually mature. Ask the Lord to bring you along further than you were yesterday. Grow in him. It leads to unity in his body. That spiritual maturity. Paul pleaded with them in that, that they all speak the same thing. And that same thing, of course, is Jesus Christ. Let him be the focus. Let him be the center of who you are in your gatherings. That there be no divisions among you. And that you be, we considered this term at length last time, we be perfectly joined together with each other. Perfectly joined together with Jesus Christ. The encouragement there was to mend. It's a term used for mending the nets. To mend rather than to break apart. And we talked about this. The truth of what Jesus has done in what his body was broken for. The truth is is that his body was broken to make us whole. And we accept that individually, but so often we shirk it when it comes to the collective sense. His body was broken to make us, as a body of believers, to make us whole in him. So we have no right in that to then go back and break his body apart into our own consumable portions and sections for ourselves. His body was broken to make us whole in him. And so we must unite in him. And in that, when anybody comes here, when anybody anybody comes through the doors here, what they should encounter is Jesus Christ. That's who they should see. In each one of our lives, in every single one of our words, they should encounter Jesus Christ, regardless of who we are or what we do. In our lives and in our body here of believers, they should see Jesus at work. And we should be willing and ready to point to who he is in all things, specifically so that they might see him above all else. They might see him. Paul had written in what we closed with last time, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And we talked about that. God does not make it complicated on us, specifically when it comes to sharing his word and sharing his message. Specifically, he doesn't make it complicated. It's specifically so that we don't lean on the wisdom of our own words and on the strength of our own logic because the cross of Jesus Christ has all of the effect. That's what's true. The cross of Jesus Christ has all of the effect in a life. And that's going to be the bulk of what we consider today. In verse 18 here, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. We talk about this very often. God just operates at a different level than we do. And there is no escaping that fact. If we could just accept that one truth in our lives, we could just accept that one truth that would remove so much confusion. He is God. He's God. That means he's bigger than us. That means he's stronger than us. That means he's smarter than us. And so often we make the mistake of considering God on the same intellectual plane as us. And that gets us us into a whole world of confusion and trouble when the truth is he is God. 
And we have to consider him as such. We have to regard him as such. We have to reverence him as such. He says clearly in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. What God has done and really, what we're going to spend the book of day, today considering, what God has done, it defies reason. Absolutely defies human common sense when you consider the full scope of the history of his creation. And never lose sight of that truth. It is his creation. He made it. It's his. It has never ceased to be his. He brought the world into existence. Every single thing that we see, every system, every manner of mineral and and elements, everything else. He brought it all into existence. He created everything, which is mind-boggling enough on its own. I mean, just study a flower this week and see what the Lord put together there in his wisdom and in his creativity. It is mind-boggling enough just considering his creation. But then to complete the entire system of what he put together, he created mankind in his own image, we're told. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, Let us make man in our image. Incredible plural there as we read this, too. Speaks of the triune nature of our God. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the, plur over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created each one of us in his own image. That's what he did. And then he gave us, as man, he gave the whole of mankind, he gave us dominion over his creation. And then we rebelled against him. We rebelled. <laughs> we were given one command. And the temptation there was not in the forbidden fruit itself. I mean, understand that when you consider the, our origins, when you consider what he's given us in the book of Genesis. We were given access and dominion over every other fruit tree over every other tree, period, to freely eat. But the serpent came and tempted Eve with the idea that if she ate of the fruit, her eyes would be opened and that she would be like God, knowing good and evil. So we're told in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So I mean, consider that. It looked like it would be tasty, the fruit. It was beautiful to behold, and it was desirable. This is what she saw, and this is what tempted her. It was desirable to make them like God. It was desirable to make them like God. And keep in mind in that, just consider the tragic irony in that. They had already, as we just heard, they had already been made in God's image. They knew that. They had been made in God's image. We have been made, each one of us. We have been made in God's image. We are reflections of his glory. And that was true from the very beginning, and it continues to be true today. You are made in the image of God. And you have been made, you have been purposed to reflect his glory with your life. That is what your life is intended for. But Lucifer, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 15, he was called the seal of perfection. It said of him there, he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He himself, I mean, see that, he himself had what Eve saw in that forbidden fruit. Pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And it said there in Ezekiel, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. He was the most beautiful of the angels. We read that he was anointed from on high, but he wanted more than what God had provided. He wanted more than what God had allowed. Eve wanted more than what God had allowed. And she wanted more than what God had provided for her. Adam wanted more than what God had allowed wanted more than what God had provided. Cain wanted more. Each one of us, very often, in one way or another, we want more than what our God has given. Having been made in God's image, I mean, consider the beauty of that truth. Him having breathed breath into our lungs, 
Him having set our hearts in motion, one beat after another after another, we so often begin to chase after his position. After everything he has already given us, we begin to chase after his throne. And the insanity in that, the absolute foolishness in that, is that he has given us access to his throne room already through his son. He has opened the doors to his throne room through the blood of his son for us. He's provided redemption for us through his son. He's provided atonement for us through his son. We treat that word atonement rightly, functionally, as at one meant atonement. We have been made at one with God and through the sacrifice that his son, our Lord, offered. <laughs> he has provided sonship. For us, He has provided son's position for us as a favored child of God through his son. And in all of that, he has given us everything we will ever need in life, entirely at the cost of himself. We have no need for more. We have no need for more than what God has provided. And yet still, so often we flounder through life attempting to ascend that same throne that Lucifer attempted to ascend and that Eve and Adam attempted to ascend out of our own pride, out of our own greed. God gave us dominion over the earth, but we forfeited it when we sought dominion over him. See that? We disobeyed him, and we rebelled against him. But in Jesus Christ, his promise to his church in Revelation chapter 3 is that we will reign with him that we will reign with him, that we will sit on his throne with him. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21 says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So as his church, as his beloved, as those who love him and believe in him, we will reign with him under his authority and under his lordship. What we're living right now, it's just practice for eternity. If he can't be your Lord right now, why would he give you lordship with him in eternity? We will reign with him under his authority. This is foolishness to those who are perishing. This is absolutely incomprehensible to those who are perishing. Consider this. Every single one of us, if we gift-wrapped a perfect work to anyone else, put all of our best effort into it, gift wrapped a perfect work, no flaw, no blemish, no fault in any of it. And we gave them one condition, don't eat from this one piece. Everything else is yours. Just don't touch this one piece. But then they turn around and do exactly what you asked them not to do, right? You're taking your, you're taking your ball and going home, and that's the end of the game. It's, we're done. <laughs> you did exactly what I asked you not to do. It was perfect, and now it's not because of you. Because of what you did, because you disobeyed the one thing I gave you to do. But then, again, just consider this. In an effort to restore that broken fellowship, in an effort to make things right again, you then turn around and you offer up another perfect work to whoever it was that rebelled against you. Another perfect work. No flaw, no blemish, no fault. And you sent this perfect work with the simple message, follow me. Follow the Son of God, and all will be well. Just love him. Just love him. But the world then turns around and attacks him, and condemns him, and beats him, and mocks him, and blasphemes, and then hangs him on a cross. And with the words that he has remaining, this perfect work of God, the words that he has remaining, he looks to heaven, and he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then he rises from the dead, he ascends into heaven, and he sends his Holy Spirit, who fills the heart of rebellious souls, who fills the heart of those who have rebelled, and creates something entirely new, something made to reflect the glory of God, something cleansed, absolutely purified by the blood of God, and inhabited and indwelt by the power of God. This perfect work now creates a new perfect work in an imperfect shell in us. <laughs> And then he continues to perfect that imperfect shell through the remainder of our days here. To the perishing, this is foolishness. This doesn't make any sense. This is foolishness. It makes no sense. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is where we find our hope. 
This is where we find our joy. It makes no sense because it makes no sense. It defies our definition of love and justice and righteousness. But our God went further for us. To those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You can learn all that there is to learn in the world. You can gain every piece of wisdom there is to have, and it will still not be enough. This will still be foolishness to you without the revelation of our Lord. We have the example of Solomon in the Old Testament. Rob brought him up last week during the teaching. The wisest who ever lived. This man who authored the book of Proverbs and a number of the Psalms and Song of Solomon. And he also authored Ecclesiastes late in his life, near the end of his life. And at that point, he had been led astray from God into open idol worship and all manner of sin and greed in his life. And looking back with great regret upon his life, you read the words there that he wrote just of a bitter and a tired man at the end of a life that he believes he has wasted. And he speaks truth in what he writes. That is the object lesson when you go through Ecclesiastes. He speaks truth but your heart aches for him as you read because he realizes the folly of his ways. The wisest man who ever lived with a volume of wisdom that we will never approach, that was how things ended because he did not give his life wholly over into the hands of God. This was a man who had everything. He had God-given wisdom to a measure no one will ever see again. Had every measure of wisdom, every luxury was given to him. He had accumulated wealth as the world had never seen and likely has not seen since. He had everything. And yet within a matter of something like five years after his death, it was all broken apart and wasted away and drained of its value. And he knew that would happen. That's what was on his mind as he wrote those words in Ecclesiastes. He knew that's the way it was going to go because God told him that's the way it was going to go. And he knew it was his fault. He knew it was because of his own rebellion. It was all gone in a matter of just a breath of time. You can have all the wisdom there is to have. You can have all the creature comforts in life. You can have all the self-constructed elements of cushion that we allow ourselves and that we add to ourselves. But without a steadfast and a patient in a day-to-day -day relationship with Jesus Christ, it will all be for naught. You'll just be left empty and tired and bitter. A thriving walk with Jesus. I mean, the thing about it is, it's not about earning your salvation. You're not securing your salvation by walking with him day to day. A thriving walk day to day with him, it is about living moment by moment in his peace, and in his joy, and in his love, and watching how that transforms who you are, and how it speaks to those who he has placed around you with your life, watching how he reflects his glory in who he has made you to be. But verse 20 here, it says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. There's a level of context in this that I think we so frequently lose just because of the, the age that we live in. We are well acquainted with the cross today. It's not foreign to us. It's not a foreign concept at all. We're well acquainted with the message of the cross. We sing songs gladly about it and rightfully about it. We make movies about it. We wear necklaces with crosses on them and get tattoos of crosses on our bodies. We put crosses on the doors of our houses. Most people out in the world, non-believers, most people have a basic understanding of what the cross is. It is so important to understand in reading this text here, it is so important to understand how downright putrid this would have been to hear that at the time these words were written. Crucifixion at that time, it was among the most brutal forms of capital punishment that Rome had. Most brutal. We always get the scrubbed down version in the pictures and the drawings and in the movies. <laughs> Romans used crucifixion as a fear tactic. And it was a very valuable one, a very effective one. It was their preferred method of executing criminals just ahead of burning them alive. 
This was number one. Burning them alive was number two. It was a means of controlling the populace for them, and it was an effective means of controlling the populace. They would crucify criminals against the empire in mass, in big masses of people. They would crucify them all at the same time outside of the city gates so that everyone would see this is an enemy of Rome, and this is what happens to enemies of Rome. It was the most shameful, the most brutal penalty they could sentence anyone to. The minimum, the average time of death on the cross was 32 hours you would hang there before you breathed your last. That's nearly a day and a half. And sometimes it would take much longer for you to finally expire. Think about that. Our Lord was spared mightily in his suffering on the cross, dying in just a handful of hours, maybe three hours when, generally speaking, it would go on for days. There would be times where you would see hundreds at a time hanging on crosses outside of a city. And the message was very clearly as you approached the city, do not cross Rome. Don't mess with us. This is what's going to happen to you. And these weren't well-guarded, well-manicured, well-protected sites, you know. The stench alone, the things we never consider, the smell, would draw in wild animals, wild beasts, dogs, and wolves and birds, they found these sites to be tremendous sources of food. And those hanging on the crosses would still be alive as the animals would descend on those areas. The mere mention of a cross at that time, it would make one shudder and draw back in disgust. It was the worst thing that you could wish on anybody. You wouldn't wish it on anybody. They had seen it all too frequently. They had been repulsed by it and disgusted by it all too frequently. That's what the message of the cross was at that time. It's a cross? Are you sure? Translate that situation to any other area, any other apparatus of capital punishment, an electric chair or a guillotine, right? Something that just symbolizes a brutal death, a heartless death, something tied intrinsically to criminal consequence, and then try to imagine carrying the message of that apparatus to an unbelieving world who's never heard this message before, but they know what the apparatus is, and they know what it means. It was a concept that was entirely foreign to the people of the time. The modern church ministers today in a world that has been conditioned to understand the cross, and that's a tremendous blessing, a tremendous favor God has granted us in this time, but the early church ministered in a world where the cross was a reprehensible sign. It was a sentence for the common criminal. And to the Greek, the Gentiles, preaching a Savior who died in such a way, who died on such an element, it spoke to them of weakness and humility and guilt. You know, how can one who bears such a thing willingly possibly be God? How is that possible? Their gods were mighty and brash, and and false, but mighty and brash. Take whatever they want, whenever they want, and win your victories at whatever cost on the basis of your own physical strength. That's the gods that they concocted for themselves. That's what they were used to hearing. A humble king tried as a criminal at the hands of men who wins his victories through surrender and sacrifice. That was foolishness to them. That made no sense to them compared with what they knew. Whereas for the Jew, they had been waiting for the Messiah for generations through several, numerous times of captivity, numerous times of oppression. And Scripture spoke to them of a great conqueror and a mighty deliverer, but it also speaks of a sacrificial lamb and of a servant king. If you've been going through the the daily Scripture reading with us, you've surely seen all of those facets as we're making our way through the book of Isaiah together. You can see it clearly in what God communicated about who his son, about who our Messiah would be. And that is a caution for us, you know. So, so often we read Scripture as we go through. We read through, we make the mistake of seeing only the things that we want to see. We make the mistake of making Scripture say what we want it to say instead of setting that time, setting the verses that are in front of us before God and asking him, God, what do you want me to see in this? What is it that you're saying in this? Because those are the places where we get lost when we go about trying, script, trying to make Scripture to say what we want it to say. God clearly presented the picture of who the Messiah would be and what he would do. And when the time came, when their Messiah was literally standing before them, it's not just that they didn't see him or recognize him, it's that they outright rejected him and killed him. They focused only on one facet of him, 
They eagerly waited the deliverance from their physical oppressors, but they couldn't fathom that before that could ever happen, they needed deliverance from their own sin. They needed victory over their spiritual oppressors, freedom from their evil hearts. And the only way that that could happen, the only way to have that was in the form of a servant redeemer who would pour out his life unto death. And the Jews could not fathom their Messiah being executed like a criminal, especially on a Roman cross. It was a stumbling block to them. And the world seeks a conqueror. And the world seeks a mighty warrior. And God has given us those things, absolutely, but he has given them in the form of a sacrificial lamb. And to those who are called, what we read here. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Rooted beneath all the shallow misconception of the message of the cross, God wove together deeper truths for anybody who would see it, for anybody who would hear it. He wove together deeper truths in this foreign instrument of capital punishment. He showed his love and he showed his mercy in his provision, and his unbelievable kindness. He showed his grace to us. And that grace over the generations has given meaning and beauty to the cross that we are able to carry forward to the world today. And to those who are called, to those who are called, they could see the deepest truth of the message. This wasn't a mere man being punished for his sin against a society. This was the Son of God taking on the punishment for all of our sin, they could see it, and they accepted it, and they lived it out. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The cross exhibits a deeper love than the world can concoct, and than the world will ever be able to concoct. The world seeks to dilute the definition of love. The cross defines love as clearly as possible, and so often it translates as foolishness to the world. The empty tomb, it presents a greater victory than this world will ever be able to manufacture. The beauty is in the fullness and in the depth of the message. It is our God opening a way for us. It's our God drawing his rebellious creation, made in his own image but broken in fellowship. It is our God drawing us back to himself. That's the truth of God's word. It's built on the message of the cross. You know, if the early church would have departed, even in the slightest, from the basic necessity, from the absolute necessity of the cross, this reprehensible symbol to the world, if they would have tried to make their teaching more palatable, more understandable, more acceptable to any of the rest of the world, the cross, the, the birthplace of our salvation, it would not have made it through to today if they would have tried to feed the world's appetites at that point. So think about that. In the current attitude in our culture, this, this current phenomenon we see of people trying to deconstruct God's word, you'll hear that term thrown around, deconstructionism, just peeling away whatever we can make palatable and popular and politically correct from God's word and discarding anything that might be of any offense, discarding anything that might be of any discomfort. And getting rid of all the blood. You'll hear people say that, your teaching's too bloody. It's, well, I don't know any other way to bring it. The teaching is bloody. Large portions of the greater church today do exactly that. And because they hang a cross over the Swiss cheese doctrine that they've pieced together for themselves, they give themselves a pass. It's okay, the cross is still here. It's still here, it's okay. We can put anything under it that we want as long as the cross is there. It's not okay. It's not okay. And see it when you see it, recognize it when you hear it. When we begin, even in the slightest, to begin to parse down God's word, Weed it out on the basis of logic or intellect or relevance or social acceptability. What we are doing when we do that, what we're doing is removing God's breath from his divinely inspired word. Understand what it is you're playing around with when you begin playing around with God's word. We remove the master strokes that he has put into place to communicate the fullness in the depth of his love to us. Or when we add anything to his word, when we add the philosophies of man or the teachings of a world that is in open rebellion to God, when we add those things, when we add the worship of false gods and demons to his word or to our lives in him, when we do that, we dilute and we confuse the power and the wisdom of God. We dilute Jesus Christ, and that's not okay. Think of it this way. 
If someone took a run toward the Mona Lisa, right, with a can of paint thinner and an orange highlighter, <laughs> there would be widespread outrage. It would just, it would offend the world's best sensibilities. It would be an act of absolute infamy, even among the most uncultured, even among those who know nothing else about art except that that smiling lady is really important in our history. It would offend and just the arrogance and the recklessness and the entitlement of such an act against the creation of a mere man. Worldwide offense, right? But we are so passive as believers in Jesus Christ when this world, when even those who would call themselves the church, when even those who would call themselves Christians do the exact same thing to the divinely inspired word of God. We are so passive. Just remove the parts we don't like and add in our own stick figure doctrine in its place. It's not okay. It's not okay. God help us. Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. He doesn't need us to serve as his negotiator with the world. He doesn't need us to serve as his broker with the world. He asks us simply to represent the fullness of who he is through the fullness of his word. So do that and don't leave any of it behind. Because in verse 25 here it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God is really, really good at keeping a proper perspective in all things, especially when it comes to his calling on our own lives. Anyone who is charged with dispensing the word of God, anyone who has been called to be his, to share who he is. Anyone is called here the foolish things of the world and the weak things and the base things, the things which are not. My family's sitting over here saying, tell us something we don't know. <laughs> but this is all of us as believers, and the foolish and the things that are weak and the things that are base, the things that are not. This is all of us. And it says here, even God's foolishness, which is not at all to call God foolish, it's simply to say that even the simplest truths of his nature, even his most basic thoughts, even the simplest truths of his being in his heart and his word, these are still wiser and deeper than the very best of us, the very best that we have to offer. The best that we've got, line up every single Nobel Prize winner, every poet laureate, every astrophysicist, put them all on a team together, and they still are not going to approach our God. They still won't come even close to our God, but God chooses the foolish and the weak and the base so that the world would see nothing but the magnificence of his word. His word does all of the work. It's our burden just to share his word. That there would be no flesh to glory in his presence. It is all him. It is all him. If you've been living your life trying to represent him by your best qualities, you're doing it wrong. Represent him simply by showing the world what he's done in your worst qualities. That's where the power is. Whatever it is that you think sets you apart from anyone else. I mean, and we all have something. Let's be honest. We all have something that we think we have going for us. Something that we think we do better. And we believe we are something because of whatever that thing is. Whether it be our quick wit or our physical strength or ability or financial acumen or even our, just our profound accomplishment in life. We think we have something that sets us apart, right? Jesus. What's true is that Jesus alone is distinctive in a life. He should be what's distinctive in your life. And his work, in the greater context of what we're reading here, his work is to unify souls into the singular body of his church. So let he be what distinguishes your life. Because it's a worthy distinction. But in verse 30 here it says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Of him you are in Christ Jesus. God provided this relationship for us. 
That's the incredible truth that's being communicated here. God provided this for us. He provided the means and the grounds and the structure of this relationship that gives our life distinction. He provided it just the same way as he provided the tunics of animal skin for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness and their shame. He has provided for us Jesus Christ to remove our shame and to remove our guilt. And as a result, what we read here, just beginning to tie everything back together to where we started today, this is the craziest piece, the most foolish to the eyes of the world piece. As a result of God's provision, as a result of God's provision of Jesus Christ, as a result of his provision of his Holy Spirit as a real and an indwelling presence in our lives, as a result of that, we have God's wisdom. That's what we're reading here. As a result of what God's provided, we have God's wisdom, the very thing that enticed Adam and Eve into disobeying God in the first place. See that? God does not withhold. They always would have had his wisdom. That was never in question. That was never in doubt. And he always would have been the source of their wisdom, and he would have given it freely, but they wanted to be able to claim that wisdom as their own. And that is the tragedy in this. They wanted themselves to be the source of that wisdom. They wanted God's position. That's what the big deal was. That's what the big deal still is today. That is where we all, each one of us, that is where we stumble in life. When we seek peace or joy or love or sustenance or satisfaction or knowledge or wisdom of God from any other source than God himself, when we do that, we sin. That is the basis of our sin when we try to supplant what he has provided and what he would have provided with our own means and our own resources. That is sin. We replace him with something altogether unworthy of him. And it proves to us to be utterly destructive every single time. And destructive to us and destructive to all of those around us. The message of the cross, and see it for what it is here, it is God's provision to restore the fellowship that we broke with him. It's his provision to restore the fellowship that we broke with him. We cannot have that restoration with him without that cross, without that thing that the world looks upon as foolishness, without that perfect work that he himself provided. So here's the thing in all of this. The cross is the tree desirable to make one wise. That's what we're reading this morning. The cross is the tree desirable to make one wise. It is a tree of which we can freely partake. Because of the tremendous price that God, our Savior, paid. And when we partake of that cross, our eyes will be opened. Our eyes will be opened when we partake of that tree. It is a tree of which we can openly invite anyone else to partake of. And it's a tree whose fruit is made available to anyone who would come before it. It's a tree which saves us from evil, far more than just knowing evil. It saves us from evil, and it provides us far more than just knowing good. It provides us with immeasurable good in our lives. It's a tree which, more than just making us like God, is a tree which invites the very nature of God into our hearts. And so we partake of that tree for him to dwell and to transform and to fill our lives with him and with his wisdom And with all the fruit of his Holy Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, Jesus became for us wisdom from God. And see that there. He became for us the very thing we tried to shoplift on our own from that forbidden tree. It's Jesus. He became for us what we have our whole lives been trying to recreate or obtain by our own means. And at the very base, again, that is the very nature of sin. To pursue by our own understanding or by our own construct or by our own desire a law unto ourselves. Sin is claiming for ourselves the place of God in our lives. But forgiveness of that sin is found in surrendering instead to what God himself has provided Jesus became for us, it says here, righteousness. That is, he takes all of our brokenness and all of our wickedness and all of our sin against his law. He takes all of that and he shapes us into his image. He plants that desire within us to live in such a way that would conform to that image. And then he fills us with the power 
to live in such a way that would conform to that image. It says here, he became for us sanctification. He became for us that which sets us apart to him. That which drives our lives into serving his will. He became for us sanctification. And then it says he became for us redemption. That which presents us to him spotless and guiltless before him. Even for the righteousness that he became on our behalf. Even for the sanctification that Jesus has become for us. There's still the matter of everything that we've already done wrong. Everywhere we've rebelled against him and everything we will still do wrong when it comes to having rebelled against God's law, when it comes to the sin that we commit. And Jesus has taken care of the cost of that. He has become for us our redemption. He has paid in full the ransom that our sin incurred against God. He redeemed us. He has become our redemption. If you're keeping track here, this is every measure of good that we have. And every single bit of it is all from him. It's what he has become for us. So for any of our pride that we still carry around in life, and we all do to some level, for any of our intellect, for any of our ability, whatever it might be, lay all of that down before him and glory instead in the Lord, who is our hope and our confidence and our worth in life. Glory in the Lord. Glory in what he has become for each one of us. Glory in what he is becoming within each one of us. And the work that he does will shine to others. It will reflect his glory to others. It will confound some. Absolutely, it will confound some. But for others, it will draw them closer to him. It will be for them the power of God to whoever will be saved. Let his work speak in your life. Let his word speak in your life. You don't have to dress it up. It'll be foolishness to the world. But he can do more than you can even begin to imagine because of who he is, because of who you allow him to be in your life. There's no need to put on a show for anyone else. He will speak loudly just through his presence in your life. And sometimes, oftentimes, he will open your mouth and put the exact words there that somebody needs to hear in that exact moment. The power of God, the wisdom of God, he has provided it. So just glory in him, and he will take care of the rest. Go ahead and read ahead. That's all of chapter one we got through. (laughs) Just got like 15 more chapters to go, so we'll get there. Um, But let's go ahead and pray. And Father God, we do, um, we just want to live life. It was said this morning with that transparency before you. Um, Not that people would just see through us and see nothing, but that they would see through us and see you. Lord, that you would be the presence in our life that draws attention, that you would be the one who works through our lives, who who speaks through our lives, who just does exactly what's needed to draw those who you love and who you have died for, uh, who you provided that redemption and that sanctification and that righteousness for, Lord. You want to reach, and you choose to use us as instruments in your hands, and we don't understand that, but we just, we give our lives over to you, just ask that you be leading us forward Lord, that you'd be showing us just that continual surrender and just, Lord, teaching us how to honor you with our lives, how to to get out of the way, how to just allow you do the things that you intend to do, Lord. So we just, we thank you again for who you are. We thank you for your word. Just ask that you draw us deeper and closer with every day that you give us. So we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.